so that's kind of slowly drawing to a close here. Um, your last chapter is actually on reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really, really important to have because the, mm -hmm. so often it's like, yeah, slavery is over and it's all happy daisies, but it's not that yeah. the, 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 the challenges of, of slavery, the legacies of slavery really linger on. And mm -hmm. um, how does reconstruction um, materialize in, in the valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me just say real quickly, um, that last chapter of the book is the reason the book exists. Oh. <laughs> because that was the the paper I presented at SCWH um, back in back in 2018 that that um, Randall Miller heard. And so, yeah, this is this is again, you know, something that that is fascinating because again, I think there is this perception, not among historians, but among the general public, war is over, slavery is over, it's all good. Um, and, and as I argue in the book, you know, when the, when the Civil War's guns fell silent, I think there was this sense of collective relief among African Americans in the Valley that, you know, the war is over, um, you know, we, we've got 13th Amendment, but then there is the, okay, well, now what? And it's just it's just the beginning of a of a new chapter, and one of the points I make in that chapter first and foremost is that I think life for African Americans, even though you don't have to navigate this, you know, I'm in Union territory, I'm in Confederate territory, I'm in a no man's land. Mm -hmm. I would argue that life is even much more difficult after the war uh, for some African Americans than it was during the conflict, because you have. Um, there, there's testimony that's given to the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, and you have a number of individuals from the Valley giving testimony, and, and one of the, the fellows I, I mentioned in, in the book uh, was uh, Watkins James. And James testified before that committee, he was asked the question, you know, what is the attitude, what is the sentiment of former Confederates toward African Americans? And he said that there was greater hatred toward African Americans in the Valley now after the war than there was during or prior to the conflict. And, and in part, you know, the, the status has changed. They're no longer enslaved. They are, are living monuments to the Confederacy's failure. Mm. It's a daily reminder. You did not win. Um, and it, it is, it is this very, very difficult world. So you do have the Freedmen's Bureau. Okay. So the Freedmen's Bureau has, has, and again, you know, you have a few individuals. It's not like you have massive amounts of, of, of humans working these, these agencies. So you have offices in Harper's Ferry, Berryville, Winchester, uh, Woodstock, Front Royal, Harrisonburg, um, Stanton, and Lexington. And they are, um, you know, getting the, the typical kinds of requests you would see across uh, the South. You know, I want to reunite with families. Um, those types of things. You see the Freedmen's Bureau, again, you know, making labor contracts, but the labor contracts they're making are, are oftentimes emulating slavery mm. in terms of, of the terms and, and what you can't do and, 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 you know, how you can come and go. But really, I spend a, a great deal of time in that chapter writing about education and the Freedmen's Schools. So, you know, there were, there were nine schools established by the end of 1865 between Harper's Ferry and Lexington. And the, I think to be a teacher or a student in those schools, and there are some teachers mm -hmm. like Sarah Jane Foster, who comes from Maine, um, you know, works in the school in Berkeley County, um, West Virginia. There are some individuals, both white and black, who are from the Valley, end up teaching in those Freedmen's Bureau schools. But these schools are attacked, whether it's day school or night school. Um, you have teachers who are attacked, teachers who are threatened, teachers who are killed. Um, and every one of the things that, that I looked at was the, the monthly Freedmen's School reports. And there was a question in that report, um, you know, what's basically the question was, well, what is the attitude of local people in Front Royal, Woodstock, whatever the case might be, toward the establishment of these schools. And incessantly, you know, throughout those, those immediate years following the war, the response was always bitterly opposed to it, 
uh, will do whatever they can to block the establishment of these schools. And so that's something that that I spent a great deal of time, you know, writing about mm -hmm. in the book is the challenges that students and teachers confronted the reality that education was the, the ultimate gateway to achieving all that that freedom and liberty had to offer. And also, there are discussions in that chapter about how African Americans push back against the, the lost cause. Um, and, and, you know, you get to late 1860s and you start to see a significant uptick in emancipation commemorations. And again, African Americans are well aware of, of the narrative that's being spouted about the war, what it was about, what it wasn't about, how slavery is being taken out of the equation, and they're doing everything they can to, to push back against, against that lost cause narrative. So again, showing a, a different kind of courage, you know, so during the war, they're doing everything they can to support the war for union, the war for slavery's annihilation after the war. Um, they're, they're trying to navigate this very complex world and also trying to make certain that the, the wrong narrative of the lost cause doesn't survive. And of course, we all know, you know, the, the weight that the lost cause has. Right. 